Hello and welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben, here to do my duty for the Imperium. This is my second video covering the Adeptus Astartes in the span of just a few days, so I'm asking you kind souls of mankind, don't send the Inquisition my way. For whatever heresy might be mine to claim, I have spread the good word of humanity's greatest warriors. The other day I did a video explaining Space Marine power armor, the power suits that are biologically connected to Space Marines acting as second skins as they charge into battle, last cannons at the ready, fear far behind. If you are not familiar with 40k, I really suggest you watch that video first, and please do not announce your ignorance in the comments below because the 40k fans will have your head. Better yet, just don't give them your address. They'll pass it right along to the Imperium of Man's intelligence apparatus, and you'll be dead within days. Anyway, if you are properly prepared with the requisite knowledge for today's video, as promised, I am going to go through the evolution of Space Marine power armor and give some details on each iteration. The first suit was the Mark I Thunder Power Armor. Of course, that name is a retronym as at the time of its introduction, this suit was simply known as Power Armor, but it was later given the Thunder moniker in honor of the Raptor Imperialis the Emperor used during the Unification Wars. The armor had evolved from the power suits worn by the Techno Barbarians, savages that roamed Terra during the Age of Strife, a fragmented period of human history that ran from the 25th to 30th millennium. This armor was designed for use on Terra, and thus did not fully enclose its wear, and obviously thus did not allow its user to subsist in a vacuum. The armor also didn't have a comprehensive life support system, and only the upper body of the armor was powered, as given the difficulty in making ranged weapons at the time, a warrior often had to rely on upper body strength to survive. Coiled energy cables beneath the armor transmitted energy from the power pack on the back to the arms of the suit, endowing the user with augmented strength. When the Thunder armor was introduced, standardization was lacking, and each suit of armor created varied to a degree. Usually the design depended on the preferences of the wearer. Eventually, when humanity began to venture into space, the forces of mankind developed a need for more capable armor. As humanity, under the will of the Emperor, crusaded further and further across the galaxy and discovered new resources, power armor evolved to be stronger and stronger. The next iteration of power armor to come along was the Mark II Crusade power armor, which was developed towards the end of the Age of Strife. The armor was used by the Space Marine Legions at the heart of the Emperor's Great Crusade across the galaxy to unite mankind into the Imperium of Man. After conquering the Sol system, the Emperor had Mechanicum factories erected on Mars that were dedicated to constructing more advanced power armor. The Mark II Crusade armor was born from these factories. The Crusade armor was the first fully enclosed power armor suit and was vacuum rated, making the Crusade easier on the Marines. But given how psycho they are, I'm sure they would have been willing to just hold their breath in space while raiding Space Hulks. The suit also had life support systems that allowed for combat in various atmospheres. The armor plates of the suit were composed of microscopic, circular armored rings of ceramite layered under and over each other. The different plates were then linked together and the power cabling of the suit was threaded inside the plating. Put together this way, the suit allowed for ease of movement, and the ceramite made the armor durable, but the ring design wasn't easy to repair. The helmet was fixed in position, but wearers could still turn their heads. The helmet had auto senses or electronic sensory systems and mini computers that monitored the surrounding area and transmitted basic visual and auditory information back to the Space Marine user. This was not done through some sort of HUD though, as we explained in the last video we did on this subject said information was transmitted to the Space Marines through their cerebral cortexes. The wearer simply learned the information instantly rather than having to read it from a display. This was the first suit to incorporate autosenses, but such tech became standard in all iterations to follow. The next iteration was the Mark III Iron Power Armor, a suit developed during the Great Crusade for use against a race of beings called Squats, short, stocky abhumans who did not want to be conquered by the armies of man. The Space Marines suffered high casualties at the pudgy hands of the Squats, as fighting them required the Marines to engage in difficult boarding operations and combat in confined underground tunnels. Thus, the Iron Armor was developed especially for such situations, and was not intended to replace Crusade Armor. The armor had much greater frontal protection than the Mark II, and the weight of the rear of the armor was decreased in order to compensate for the gain in front. The idea was to make the armor ideal for all-out frontal assaults. The wedge shape of the helmet with sloping plates was designed to deflect incoming fire from the front, and would later inspire the Mark IV and VI helmet designs. 
Now, just as a note, the Mark 1 through 3 armors are no longer in use by any Space Marine chapters and are rare to even come upon, though you can get lucky on eBay every once in a while. Next comes the Mark IV Maximus Power Armor, a suit produced at the height of the Imperium of Man during the Great Crusade to replace the Mark II suits the Space Marines had mostly worn out. The Maximus is the first power armor with a design directly related to modern Space Marine armor. It traded the separate abutting plate design of older suits for larger, more inflexible armor casings with flexible joints. While the Maximus decreased the flexibility of the suit's various parts, because it was lighter than previous iterations, Space Marines actually gained mobility in this armor. Additionally, the Mark IV was easier to produce and maintain. The more lightweight design was the result of technological secrets discovered by man that allowed the factories on Mars to make more efficient suits while not sacrificing anything in terms of protection. Actually, these tech secrets led to improved armoring that allowed the suit's power cables to be placed on the exterior of the armor. And not only were the amount of cables decreased, but all of the systems in the suit's backpack and the backpack itself were made smaller in size and more efficient than in previous versions. The suit's helmet was also a completely new design, as it was no longer fixed to the suit's neck plates and can move independently while maintaining its seal. In the 31st millennium, Imperial Warmaster Horus Lupercal, the Primarch of the Sons of Horus Legion, became corrupted by the ruinous powers of Chaos, and he betrayed the Imperium of Man, taking much of the Imperial forces with him. This led to a galaxy-wide civil war known as the Horus Heresy that plagued humanity for nine years. This is where the Mark V Heresy Power Armor comes in. After the Horus Heresy broke out, many of the Loyalist Marine chapters still hadn't been outfitted with Mark IV armor, and were stuck to fight traitor chapters in Mark II armor. Additionally, during the Civil War, given the widespread nature of the Imperium's operations and the amount of damage suits of armor suffered in battle, resupply and repair was difficult. Thus, the Mark V Heresy armor was developed from very basic materials so that it was easy to maintain. The Mark IV was a much more advanced suit of armor, but the chapters involved in the heresy couldn't maintain them. That said, the Mark V wasn't exactly a perfect option. It had heavy power cabling and substandard materials which caused the suit to overheat quickly, and to compensate for this, wearers would often turn down the power output of the suit, meaning they would sacrifice performance. The helmet of this iteration was a more basic version of the Mark IV's helmet. After the heresy ended, these suits were rarely used and were often scrapped so that their parts could be used to repair Mark IV or later power armor. Now before we move on here, I just want to point out that the Mark VI through VIII armors mark an era of Space Marine armor in which the armors were specifically designed to be rugged and adaptable. The Mark VI Corvus or Coronavirus power armor was another armor that was developed during the Horus Heresy to replace the Mark IV armor. The Corvus armor, also known as the Beaky armor, was named for the Raven Guard Legion's Primark Corvus Corax, and stood out in a number of ways, but perhaps its most prominent features were its beak-like muzzle and its molecular bonded studded autoreactive bolt-reinforced left shoulder plate. The Corvus armor, like the Mark V, was intended to be easy to maintain and repair, and it continued the practice of the Mark V of using molecular bonding studs to hold the armor's plasteel and ceramite layers together. Though the Mark VI was specifically known to boast the lightest form of this technology. And Space Marines often say that this armor offers the most comfortable fit. The armor had dual technology circuits which allowed for its more complicated parts to be replaced with more generic parts without sacrificing performance, and it also contained duplicate power cabling which functioned as a failsafe. The Corvus armor is still commonly used by Space Marine chapters to this day. Next up is the Mark VII Aquila Power Armor. This suit, developed on Terra towards the end of the Horus Heresy when Mars was expected to soon be lost, is the armor most commonly used by the Space Marine chapters of the Imperium to this day. This armor is noteworthy for the Vox Caster on its faceplate and the Imperial Aquila or Imperialis on its chestplate. Vox Casters are radio communications transceivers that Imperium forces use to communicate trooper to trooper or with headquarters. Technology and design-wise, the Aquila armor is mostly just a small update from the Mark VI, and parts from both suits can be used on one another pretty much interchangeably. Next, we have the Mark VIII Errant Power Armor. Similar to the Mark VI and VII suits, the Mark VIII has enhanced armored plating, which better protects the power cables on the torso, which in the Mark VII were much more exposed to incoming fire. The Mark VIII is probably most recognizable for its raised collar, called a gorget, in the front of the suit for extra protection. With the Mark VII, incoming rounds would often hit the chest plate and deflect up to the neck joint. 
The Mark 8 score jet solves this issue. However, given the significant change, this suit is not backwards compatible with Mark 6 and 7 helmets without heavy modification. The Mark 8 suit never went into wide scale production and was mostly issued to higher ranking Space Marine officers, which endowed the suit with an air of authority. Finally, we have the Mark 10 power armor. And for those of you who are going to ask about the Mark 9, listen. The first rule of 40k Space Marine armor is that we don't talk about the Mark 9. As one user asked on Reddit a few months ago, quote, what the F happened to the Mark 9 power armor? To which a veteran of the Imperial Guard responded, quote, same thing that happened to Windows 9. And that's all I'm going to say on that because I don't want to disappear. Anyway, the Mark 10 marks a significant upgrade from all of the previous suits of power armor. 10,000 standard years ago, Ultramarines Primark Robute Gilliman commissioned a project to develop a legion of transhuman warriors that would be superior in every way to the standard Space Marine. After 100 standard centuries of development, the result of this project was the Primaris Space Marines. Of course, if you're going to spend 10,000 years developing Super Space Marines, then you had better develop power armor that's worthy of such a Space Marine legion as well. Thus, we get the Mark 10 which combines all of the best elements of all iterations of Space Marine armor, with the most heavy inspiration coming from the Mark IV and Mark VIII patterns. That said, the Mark X has a modular design and is more versatile than its predecessors, and there are many variants of this model of armor used by different units of the Primaris Marines. The armor is actually designed to attach to a special protective undersuit that enables it to be fitted to each Marine in different configurations as needed. Examples of some of the features one might find on a given variant are enhanced protection throughout the entire body of armor, more efficient backpack heat ventilation, guidance thrusters integrated into greaves, grav chutes for controlling low orbit drop speeds, helmets with expanded rebreather filters for low orbit combat drops, and an external hydraulic footplate for controlling the power and direction of the jump pack's thrust. The Mark 10, in all its variants, is the OP armor of already OP armor. And those are all of at least the general Space Marine Power Armor models. Um, give this video a like if you enjoyed it. Definitely let me know in the comments down below what I missed, what I got wrong, which models are your favorite, which ones you hate, what makes sense, what doesn't, whatever you want. Um, yeah, remember to subscribe to this channel and hit that notification bell. I hope you enjoyed the 40K content. We've got some Expanse content on the way. Um, for now, my name is American Ben, and I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.